I stand in all of you In all of you My God From the top once again I stand in all of you Holy One Mighty God I raise my hand to you Awesome King and Mighty God. So anybody remember last week's sermon? Talking about the predestination of God. How He dominates, predestined, control all things. Basically, we don't have much choices in life because He's the one that prepared all things. But we do have a choice, which is a moral choice. In every single turn, any, any single cross, crosswalk, crossroad, we are going to make our decision. And you can make a, a moral, a good decision, or you can make a decision that is according to the flesh, or you can make a decision according to the spirit. And basically, the entire life is like a journey under God's predestination. And to, to remind us a little bit more about his predestination, we look at what King Solomon was saying in Ecclesiastic chapter 3. Actually, chapter 3 of Solomon talks about there are times for everything, right? Times for life, time for death, time for mourning, time for dancing, time for unity, you know, time for reframing from unity. Uh, so it's all kinds of time that God has set. You don't set those times. If God wants you to live, uh, you know, 50 years, you're not going to live 50 years in one day because the time is set by Him. But you can have a choice of how to live your life, you know, in, in God's will, or you want to live it according to your own flesh. So, it's evidently, it's God set for the warriors to, to lose their winning streak on the 24th, right? That's why they lost the game yesterday. Because if God set you, set your winning streak to be 24, there's no way you can win the 25th game, right? And if God set you to break all the records, then nobody really can stop you from breaking all the records. So it, it is a really, really uh, amazing way to look at life like this. So if we understand the full powers of God, we have a different point of view in life. So we know that is, you know, the ultimate, most important thing is to please Him because he is the one that really rules it all. So in Ecclesiastic chapter 3, uh, after Solomon was talking about all the time set, and then he comes in in verse 10, I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So there are things that you will not understand in this life, okay? And no matter how you can think about it, do research and how you can study, you are not going to find the answer. This is what the Bible is telling you because God is so great. It's like my cat, no matter how smart it is, it will never understand me fully because God is so great that man can never understand the fullness of a lot of things. So this is why King Solomon was saying that he was being the most, the wisest man on earth, right? Nobody would say they're wiser than King Solomon, right? If you say that, that already shows that you're stupid. So King Solomon is so wise, but he said that yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. We can get a pieces, little piece, bits and pieces of it and understand something about salvation, something about his love, something about this and that, but nobody understands the whole thing about God, what he does from the beginning to the end. And I know, in verse 14, I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. Now that is really a serious matter. That means if God have set a wife for you, right? He's not going to, you're not going to have two wives or you're not going to have no wife because there are no eraser on his pen. So if he writes something, 
nothing is going to be add on, nothing is going to be subtract from it. So whatever God is, 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 is designed for you in your life, like you're going to have this, 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 nothing is going to be subtract from it, and nothing can add on to it. So basically, this is like serious stuff, serious predestination. Domination is not even a word for it. Control is, no, no, it's not about control. It's about predestination. He predestined everything. It's just like you, you know, you get a car, you get a Mercedes or whatever. You know, you're not going to get some extra wheel. You're not going to get some extra thing that the designer is not put in that car. It comes like this and uh, you cannot add another door into it because it's, <laughs> it's not your choice, okay? This is how it comes. It has what it is and you will take exactly what it is. It's like nothing is going to subtract from God. So, now understanding the, his awesomeness and his, his, his power over our life. Now, we come back to our little people walking through this life, making every decision in this maze, right? Come to this maze, should I make a left turn or the right turn? You know, and we're always making a decision. This is our moral decision in life. But basically, you cannot get away from this whole maze because it's, it's got predestination. And sometimes... Uh, if we're, we're not mature, you know, sometimes people are saying that, you know, the difference between a man and a boy is their toys. It's really not their toys. It's, it's how much they understand about themselves. When I was a kid, I really don't understand myself. I thought I understand myself, but I really don't understand myself. When I was up to like 30-some years old, I was really thinking, yes, I really understand myself now. No, actually, now I look back, he doesn't know anything. You know, my, my 30 years old me was, didn't know anything. When I was 40 some years old, I think, hmm, now I really get a grip of life. I know what life feels, you know. And uh, no, now I'm 56 and I'm thinking, okay, I guess I am getting the hang of it now. I understand what humanity is all about. Because all these little bits of movement that you don't know how to treasure, there's no way you know how to treasure. But now as you get older, you understand that all these little pieces of movement is what makes your life, makes up to your life. It's so precious. It's so precious to see something that is touching. It's so wonderful to receive a gift, a hug, a, a kind word, you know. A, a, it's, it's really, really wonderful. And I started to appreciate every single meal you know, if you have some good meal, something that you eat and it's good, and that shows that you're old, okay? If you're not old, you will not start appreciating what you eat. Uh, so it, it's like, as you get older, you are starting to see all this moment that you pass through the struggle, the joy, the peace, and I mean, all those things is what make up your life. And we are really like very, very small in His vast glory and His predestination. We are so small. We just finished watching a movie called In the Heart of the Sea. Uh, I don't know if any of you like Moby Dick, but it was a really, really great movie. So anyway, they, they were really like killing the whale in the beginning until they faced this. Finally, this, this white whale is the Moby Dick whale. It's like the awesome whale. They call it like a monster because it's totally like 10 times bigger than a boat, you know. And they're still trying to catch up with the spear. That's so stupid. Okay? If something is that big, with that much of mass, you don't want to mess with it, okay? You just leave it alone. If you, if you stab him, that thing will pull you, mess up your whole entire boat, right? As it goes down in that speed. So anyway, it was talking about this kind of fight between this guy and this team fighting. And of course, the wind, in this story, the, the whale won, right? Messed them all up, and they're all like, 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 a, like, 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 in the islands, they have no boat, they have no food, they have no water, they're waiting to die, you know, there's a few of them, and they're scrunchy, and they, they try to scrap up some old boat to go up. So the captain is still, you know, trying to fix up that old boat. And then the, the, the handsome actress, actor, actor, no, actor, uh, Chris S. well, he's so handsome. I think he's probably the most handsome guy in Hollywood right now. Anyway, he was, Chris was saying that, you know, you know, that thing up there outside is like, you know, so, it's so monstrous. There's no way we can survive going out with this broken bowl, okay? Because he's waiting out there. He was wailing. It's like, you know, you were kicking, uh, beating up 
I'll will, because he was trying to basically try to save his family. And now it's my turn to kill you guys, right? So you'll say, you know, we're not going to make it out there. We're not going to make it out. And then the captain was saying, do you know that we are created in the image of God and we are supposed to take dominion over the creations? You know, it's giving this Bible stuff. How, how, how we are like the master of the universe. And then Chris was saying, you still believe that? <laughs> we are dust. We are being bit up. We have no chance, right? And that, that movie was so beautifully made. So beautiful. Uh, because it shows that when, when man comes into this, we always think that we are cool, we are good. If you really come down to the animals, you can't even beat up a little tiny tiger, you know, or a little bear come at you. But men always think they're so great until they face something that's really enormously great, then they will be starting to be humble. Actually, the whole movie was very, uh, very beautiful because this guy is humbling by life, humbling by that experience. So, as we're growing up, God is going to keep on humbling you and keep on humbling you. And this is why Ecclesiastes 3, chapter, uh, the chapter 3, verse 15, it says this. is a God, oh, on the 14, at the end of it, God does it so that people will fear Him. God does all these things so that you know that He is God and you are man. That's why He predestined all these things and lets you know that you really, is just like us. And King David, when he realized about the true face of humanity, he said, that, oh, we are worms, you know. He's a king. And he said, oh, I'm a worm. I mean, I'm basically a worm. Comparing to the greatness of God, we're nobody. We're just like dust. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how we feel or what should we do in this little journey in this kind of dust-like, humble journey of life. And you, we have to fear Him. We have to seek His will. We try to please Him, right? Uh, we try to do the right things. We try to make the right choice. And this is a journey that takes a long time. So I want to go back into Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 10. Say, I have seen the burden God has laid it on the human race. The original text of these verses is basically like, the trial that God has put men through, the, the turmoil that God has, the tough time that God has put man through. Why? Because He wants to humble you. He wants to mold you. He wants to shape you. He wants you to understand life. Because you come out so arrogant, you don't even understand yourself. So, so God is trying to mold us. So, and it, it's a long process. It's not like a burden that can put on you and you just fling it off. You know, it's something, this kind of, the verses right here is talking about the burden is like a long, long trial that put on you, that you have to go through, you have to walk through it for life, right? It's tough because many things is going to come in times. You're not going to bear for your bad fruits or your good fruits, you know, just like that in days. A lot of things, it takes a long, long time before it reveals it's true face, right? Sometimes you, you have a boyfriend and he seems so good. The second year, walking with him, he seems so good. Third year, seems okay. Fourth year, okay. Fifth year, you know, by the time he gets up to the eighth year, he's almost like a demon, okay? But not a big demon. So I say, well, I already wasted eight years with him. So I might as well, you know, get married. And then you see the real face when he was... So it takes time to really know somebody. There's a Chinese saying, saying that you really takes, it really takes a long time before you know the true characteristic of a person. Because everybody can act really friendly with you, and you're not hurting him, okay? And it's all, all, all friendly thing. But if you really come to live with somebody, and that person, how he will act when he's frustrated? How will he will act when he was being wounded and hurt? You know? Will he get envy when everybody else is getting so good and he is all messed up? You know, you don't know that kind of stuff until you really, really uh, spend a lot of time with somebody. And the thing is, actually, we don't even know ourselves. You don't even know how 
yourself, your true self is. You may think you're good, but you may not be so good. And you may think you're bad, but actually you may not be that bad. So uh, uh, one, of my, one of the brothers from China, he was asking me a very, very uh, uh, unique question. How should I view myself? How should I look at myself? You know, I said, well, just go look at the Bible, and the Bible will be like a mirror, you know, and you can see, are you good and not good? I mean, it's an easy saying, but actually, a lot of time when we read the Bible, we don't really see ourselves. Oh, you see King David's fall? Oh, yes. You know, you see Solomon messed up at the end? Oh, yeah. But you don't really look at it in a way that you can see, reflect to yourself. You know how much wrong you have made, how much mistake you have made in your life? That's a mirror. But we don't read it so personally. We thought we were reading other people's story. And that's why the Bible has a lots of problems. Sexual problems, financial problems, uh, 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 character problem, all kinds of problems in the, in the Bible. It's, like, it's worse than the, uh, uh, the, 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 what do you call that? Soul proper? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, but the Bible has something that is even worse than the soul proper. Why? Because it is supposed to be a mirror for us to reflect on ourselves and to gauge ourselves and see where we stand. Right? It's a long process. When I, when everybody know I'm a very animal lover. Nowadays I have four cats at home. But I wasn't born to be an animal's lover. In the beginning, I thought, you know, I'm playing with some insects and I thought it's fun. I remember was uh, playing that kind of ju fan zai, you know, like a cooking thing that Chinese people, old Chinese folk used to play. Now nobody plays that kind of stuff. But anyway, at those days, we have those ju fan zai. It's, it's like pots and pans uh, that you can play around with with girls. And I don't have anybody to play with. I only play with my sister. Of course, we play pots and pans. So, but then it's no fun to play in pots and pans. So we, we are so inventive. I'm going to get those canned food, you know, the empty can from the canned food. And I put it on the fire. And I'm going to catch some caterpillars. And I put some butter on it and fry them. So we're really cooking pots and pans, right? And my sister was really happy. I was the greatest brother to be so inventive. So we are cooking the caterpillar. But little did I know that I'm killing the caterpillar because I was a kid. I thought that was fun. You know how little kids, they hurt a lot of things? And they didn't even know they're hurting. That's why, you know, sometimes kids would do something they, uh, I don't know, but they're regretting for all their life. But something very cruel. It's done by the kid because the kid doesn't know how cruel that is. The one of the things that I really would never forget is one time with a whole bunch of kids, we are so bored, you know, in the countryside. We have nothing to do. And we saw one of these huge flocks. It's just toads, I think they call it a toads. A toads inside of the crack of the rock. And no matter what we poke him, he was hiding there, he won't come out. So I said, okay, let's see, let's get some hot water. We have some boiling hot water and we spill it on it. And of course, a toad is like, really, really hurt and trying to get out and trying to run away in a, in a really, in a, we, he totally injured that, that frog, that toes. So all the kids are really scared, they oh no. And then I'm the one that has the good heart now because I want to kill him. I don't want him to suffer like that. After being like half of this 90 degree, 90 degree burn by hot water, right? So I grabbed a stick and I was hitting, smacking him, smacking him along the way on the country's rock. And the, the thing was keep him walking and I was smacking him, smacking him for like 15 minutes. I literally probably smacked him for like 500 times. But because the stick wasn't hard enough or not strong enough and I'm a little kid and that toes is so super strong. So every smack I say, come on, die, die, die. But it just won't die. And after that, I was so traumatized. I was so traumatized, you know. I, I locked myself in the room and I feel like I have hurt something really bad. But actually, I was trying to kill him to end his suffering, but it's still very bad. And then I remember one time, we went to somebody's house and they cooked dog. They cooked baby, baby puppy, you know. Uh, you know. So the, mom was, the mom's dog was, was, was wailing and crying and then we're cooking. And so all the little kids would say, we're not going to eat that. It's so, so cruel because we saw them hanging all these dogs with a stick. And the little puppy, because they're, they're not so heavy, 
So it takes them a long time to die with, with the stick ha hanging. And they're like, you know, very cute thing. And I was like, gee, that's so cruel. So that night, we, we are like in a fast something. All of our kids is using this one, the white banners. And we don't know how to write things on it. So we're using a red crayon to write an X. It means no dog it, it means in our mind. And so during dinner time, we all like, like the dog was right there. And we're not, not eating. And then so my dad feels kind of like, like uh, not so polite because we went to somebody else's house. And cooking some puppy for you is very, very serious delicacy. So they set us aside. So we all the kids was, was eating on the side very unhappily, but we don't have any dogs on our table because we, we feel like we want to have a revolution or something, <laughs> okay? So I was touring all those things. If you catch me in some moment, you would think this kid really is like a monster to animals. If you catch me in some other moment, I am pretty like a saint, you know? I really love animals. But actually, I wasn't really take shape and form until now, until as I grow up, then I totally becomes a person that loves animals. But if you judge me on that, I don't know if I love animals or not. Because I can do something right, I can do something wrong. Basically, I am going through all the trials that God has set me, to mold me, to show me how painful it is, so I can have the compassion to some animals, right? But basically, all this thing takes shape. Life is a grand process. You don't make a couple mistakes and we're going to say you're bad. And you don't do a couple great things and God says, oh, this guy is good. No. It's like going to school. A 2F doesn't mean you're a bad student. And a couple of A's doesn't mean you're a great student either. It's a long process, a grand process. I mean, after all these years of studying, your attitudes, you know, your punctuality, your, your, how you do every single task and how you, how you study, what kind of a, a situation are you there to study with, and what kind of, uh, some, people, some kids have to go to sc uh, school and they have to go to work full time and study, right, remember? So it's not a fair fight. You can't, really cannot judge people so black and white. But God knows how to judge. Only He knows how to judge perfectly because He's the one He's the author of our life. He set up everything in our life, and we're just going through it. So as you're going through, you're starting to learn that it's very hard to judge somebody. It's very hard to judge somebody because you don't live their life. You don't have their problem. You don't have their spiritual DNA or whatever DNA. You, know, you just have to strive yourself to the best you can be and try not to judge so bad. And I remember uh, uh, there was this great pastor called Jimmy Swagger, and later on he had a problem. He was being pulled down, and then Jim Baker, you know, there was a lot of uh, uh, Stephen Tong, you know, now he's having a problem. So you can see a lot of great men of God, and they all fell. And sometimes we wonder, how can a great man of God have this kind of sin, right? Stephen Tong was being accused for homosexuality, and Paul Cain, the main, the most prominent prophet in the charismatic realm, Paul Cain. I went to his uh, 2,000 people uh, uh, crusade, and he was like prophesizing, hey, you, come from Kentucky, you know, and the Jesus Christ is going to visit, vis uh, visit you next Tuesday, next Thursday, and then you, you know, your, your husband just left you, and then uh, uh, your son, you're seeking the, the healing of your son because he's got cancer, but God said he's going to heal you, you know, all those things are very, very accurate. They're even calling, uh, calling people from us. They're you, from Oakland, you know. So, he's a really, really major. Well, nobody would say that prophetic power is greater than Paul King. But he is a homosexual. He got caught as a homosexual. And when he confessed, it was a long time, ever since he was a kid. You know. So, it's so amazing. It's like, why? Why will all these things happen? But I learned not to judge anymore. You know, there are so many pastors outside. If they're not good, you just go to a different church. You don't have to bring him down. It's just like you're going to a restaurant and the food wasn't good. You know, 
You don't want to break the windows. You don't want to, you know, shut them down and write bad critic to make sure they don't open, right? You just move on because you don't know their trouble. You don't know how they struggle out. I mean, look at King Solomon. He was really messed up. You know, if you, if you study King Solomon, his, his life was really messed up. Turning away from God, building temples that is not of God, right? But look at all the book that he wrote in the Bible. Why you keep reading it? Why you keep reading this sinner, you know, and thinking that he is wise when he is making such a big mistake? Why God didn't punish him? At least don't let him, don't, let, don't, don't honor his writing into the Bible, right? Because God sees things differently. And also the Bible also says, if you save somebody soul, right? If you save one soul, it will cover many sins. So it is pretty smart if you're trying to do a lot of gospel work. Because once you catch a few souls, it says, yeah, so I have some leeway to make some mistake, you know? I have some, uh, what do you call that? A credit. A credit, yeah. Yeah. Did any, any one of you never save anybody in your life? Bring anybody in Christ. You didn't bring a single soul in Christ. Just raise your hand. Don't, 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 don't be, you never save anybody. So Chris, you really have to be careful. There's no credit to save you from this. <laughs> but, but you see what I mean? There are so many things in this, in this life that only God sees, right? God sees your struggle. God sees your cry. God sees your situation. God knows how hard you try. So when you fall, he is the one to judge you. And it's not me, not you. Because our judgment is so shallow. Our judgment is just looking this black and white. It's almost like a guy judging this, this whole student. Oh, you had an F? You're a bad student. But that may be the cup, only two F he got in his whole time of, of, of school time, right? But we, we really don't know. But only God reads the heart. God reads the heart. We're all like struggling in the dark, stumbling, you know, searching. And when the light comes on, there's always a fair share of blame that goes around. And everybody says, hey, you didn't do this. Hey, this is but the point is, it's not about how many times you fall. It's about how many times you get back up. And how you keep on pursuing to seek the will of God and trying to do the right thing. Life is like this. And when you're a little kid, you really do not grasp what I'm saying. But as you, as you grow up, you see that everyone is under that kind of, you know, as what uh, Kevin was talk, sharing on Friday, that we all fall short of the glory of God. That anyone can say that I'm, I don't have any sin. You know, even the Pope, you think the Pope will not sin, right? But definitely he will sin. There's no man, no man that will not sin. He may not have big sin, but he will have sin in the eyes of God somehow. Because in the Bible, the, the, uh, the, 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 the sin is very, very tough. If you want to bring it up. If you hate your brother, you just hate your brother. Right? The Bible counts you as you are a killer. You are a murderer. And actually the Bible adds on to say, and we know that a murderer will not go have everlasting life. So if you hate your brother, basically what the Bible is saying, you cannot go to heaven. And how many times we hate our brothers? Did any of you never hate anybody in Christ? Oh, it's very easy to hate somebody, you know. It didn't even talk about how much you hate. I mean, not talk about action. And if you have greed, the Bible said, you are worshiping idol. If you are rebellious, like talking back to your mom, you think rebellious, I'm just rebellious, I'm just talking bad. No, rebellious is equivalent to witchcraft and worshipping false God. You think you can go to heaven when you have one time of rebellion? So that's why communion is so important. Actually, not just communion. It's every single day we need the grace of God to survive. Without His grace, our sin is going to pile up before you can ever imagine. And of course, uh, there are different 
uh, a level of sin. Because sin, some sins are not as great as other sins. So not all sins are equal, right? And I was never, I never understand why Jesus Christ was saying that. Surely I say to you, if you look at a woman and you lust after her, for surely that person has committed, is in the past tense, adultery. And adultery is the ultimate in all sexual sin. All. It's even greater probably than other things. So, but it's so easy to commit. If you look at a woman and you lust of it, you have already committed adultery. You know how Jesus Christ talked? Uh, he is not talking like anybody else because he is the word himself. He is God himself. He is the truth himself. And when he says something, it's very absolute. He has, by, by no means, he has a problem of grammatic, uh, uh, grammatically or he, he know how to, doesn't know how to express something. He expresses perfectly. And especially when he said, truly and truly, I say to you. Whenever he said truly and truly, or surely and truly, once he said that, that means, listen, this is really serious, okay? And then he said, listen. And then he's talking about, if you look at a woman and lust after her, you have already committed adulterous. And I never understand why it makes it so hard, right? Because if, if this is real, well, of course it's real because he said it, and with the truly, truly, I know this is exactly what he meant. So how many men here, I mean not kids, but how many men here can raise their hand and say, in my entire life I have never looked at a woman and lust after her? So adulterous aren't we all? Basically that is exactly the point. That is exactly the point. And that's why when that adulterous woman comes and Jesus says, any one of you have never sinned, cast the first stone. Because nobody has never sinned. And we all fall short of his glory. And you say, that, well, I, did, I didn't commit big, big one, but hey, I, did you, have you ever looked at a woman and lust after? You are adulterous. And say, it cannot be real. That is too harsh. In that case, everybody is a sinner. Well, exactly. Yes. We are all sinners. Whether you know or not, you, sometimes you hate somebody, that is a murder. That puts you as a murder in the eyes of God. That's how tight that, 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 that standard is. And I heard a pastor was talking about, oh, it doesn't mean that. What it means is we, uh, we cannot stop the, uh, the bird from pooping over our head. Right? But we can stop the bird from nesting over our head. So when you see a woman and you lust after her, just make sure you stop that, trying to stop that thinking. Don't just continue to think of it, think of it, and make it happen. Because when you make it happen, then you are adulterous. Now I'm pretty sure this is not theologically correct because otherwise Jesus doesn't have to say shooty and shooty because you don't have to go through it. You don't even have to go through the motion. Your thought counts. And that is how God looks at sin. I want to read you this list of sin. <laughs> Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 and verse 24. 19 to 24. You know, if, if, you, if we really want to pursue, get rid of sin, I think you should start reading this. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immoralities. Sexual immorality is very easy to commit. Because in this culture, every, I mean, it's so casual. You know? I find it hard to, to see too many guys' hands can rise up and say, hey, I'll never have any sexual immoralities. Right? Impurity. Gee, who can be so pure? And debauchery. Idolatry. Is I, never, I never have idolatry. Greed is idolatry. Have you ever greed? Have you ever had greed? When you can go to a better job, but then missing your Sunday service, that is basically idolatry. Because you're putting, you have to greed over something, money, a better life, and putting over God's word, okay? And witchcraft. Witchcraft is basically controlling. If you're trying to control somebody, whether it's your daughter, whether it's your son, controlling spirits is equivalent to witchcraft. And also rebellious, rebellious is also equal to witchcraft. I have never argued with anybody 
I have never raised my tone of voice to anybody that his position is higher than me. Even if he's wrong, and I know he, I'm right, he's wrong, I will still submit. Because that's how God said it. This is what the Bible said. The people that is on top of you, in position-wise. No, they didn't get that position themselves. God predestined that over you. So to see how you act in submission. Hatred. That's so easy to mess up. So somebody cut in front of you in the lane, you know. My wife is totally the master of this, this skill. It's like, you know, it will, it will get her upset. I don't know, maybe some of you are like that too. That's why you're like, I got laughing. And are all you, you pretty, pretty nice people driving? I think I'm a pretty nice people driving. Sometimes I only act mad because my wife was sitting next to me. I try to, you know, make her feel that I'm one with her. <laughs> and discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish, Oh, selfish ambition. I was looking the other day. Ambition? <laughs> ambition is part of the sin. No, selfish ambition. <laughs> okay, that's different. <laughs> Dissensions, factions, and envy. Now, drunkenness. I'm never trying to get drunk because drunkenness is a big sin. Orgies. Yeah, don't even think about it. And the like. I warn you, and I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Isn't this really, really straight? If you really read the Bible, it's really scary for the thing that it says right here. If anybody lives like this, you don't have to live at all, you just have one of, the, one of the others, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. Isn't that scary? It's really scary. And then, of course, Paul continued to explain why is it like this. It says, those who belong to, in the third verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. So don't tell me God did not give you a choice to pick your wife. Or God did not give you a good choice to pick a good boyfriend, or pick a good job, or pick a house that you like. You just feel like you don't have much choice. You don't feel like you exercise your fresh human desires and your passions, you know, because you really don't have anything. When you become Christian, all those things is supposed to be crucified on the cross along with your old self. Christians are not entitled to anything. We're not entitled to anything, literally. Because all our, our human desires and passions are already crucified on the cross. We are willing to submit to God and submit to His predestination. And we want to do our best to please Him. And that's one thing that we must do, and that is in uh, efficient. Chapter 4, 21 to 24. When you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former ways of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desire, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You see this? You didn't turn bad all of a sudden because your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, it's like more and more all your desire, you know, makes you, in the beginning, it's really not bad. Everybody got a nice tennis shoes. Everybody got nice tennis shoes. And then I don't have a nice tennis shoes. So I get angry, you know. I remember taking Lemuel into one of these shoe shops. At that time, I don't have much money. And of course, uh, my late wife really, really spoiled Lambeau. She's telling Lambeau, oh, dad is going to take you buy his shoes. No, just give, give him whatever he wants. So I go in there, and old man like me, we're always wearing those like $20, you know, uh, tennis shoes. But at that time, the tennis shoes is already going up to like $100. And to me, it's like a mind-blowing thing. Why would, why would everybody 
buy a ninety some dollar Nike, right? It's like totally ridiculous because our generation we were five dollar tennis shoes, right? Of course, you don't buy this anymore. <laughs> but anyway, you can still get a good chance. And then I saw one tennis shoes is like forty some dollars. It looks really cool to me. Then I was given to to lend me, right? Like, hey, how about this one? Because this into a budget, I was thinking about fifty bucks. <laughs> And then he's looking at this 40 some dollar, and he threw it away. He th literally threw it away. And I picked it up, it's pretty good. And he was really pissed. He was really pissed. And at the end, I think that, I forgot what happened at the end. So when I, when I went back home and I tell, 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 my, uh, tell my late wife, and I say, hey, you know, she's really, uh, he's really uh, upset. She said, of course, just give him whatever he wants. You see? Because Lambeau think that everybody has a, 90 some dollar tennis shoes, that he's entitled to a 90 some dollar tennis shoes. So this kind of ad character in him, like I should have a choice to get what I desire. I should have a choice to, to go the, the path where I have my own passion. This is a total liar and a deceitful manner that the devil has been playing on him. And he's still fighting until today. I'm not saying that because I'm not trying to put down Lemuel, he's a great guy. But I'm saying that, you know how, how our character is being shaped as all the twists and turn into this predestination maze, that all the decision you make, you don't just turn becomes like this. But you've been constantly like molding you, molding you, allowing yourself, allowing saying, you know, you, you, you can have some sin, but you don't want to have an addiction. You don't want to have something that is binding you that you cannot break through. And some women, women they are very, very into controlling. In the beginning, it's not like serious controlling. They just like, they, because they know what is the best. But the children doesn't know what is the best. So on a mixture, they get the best. So I start to control, control, control. And later on, you control your husband. You control this and control. And later on, you cannot control anybody. You start controlling, I don't know, whoever you can get behind us. <laughs> And then you turn into a Jezebel, you don't even know. I want to spend an entire day talking about controlling spirit, you can understand. It's so easy, so easy to become a manipulating person. And your, your motive is perfectly good. It's I control this, I shove this to you because I know this is good for you. It's not bad intention, it's perfectly good. But that is witchcraft. And God hates it. Because when we do that, we don't, we're not human anymore. If you understand you're human, you're just dust, you're just warm, worm, you know, just humbly walk your path. Don't criticize other people. And that's why Jesus said that we are all adulterous. So you're all sinner. So don't cast the first stone. Just do your part. And what we have to do is right here. Lay off your sin. Turn off your sin. Turn off your your old shell. I was saying to myself, if I'm going to tattoo anything on my body, this is one of the worst that I'm going to put on. <laughs> the righteous will eventually turn away from wickedness. So, let me give you quickly a, a couple, a few more uh, verses. Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. You don't have to go to it because it's going to be fast. So it's not, what it means is the, the, the ritual, the religious ritual on outside of circumcision, it's not the main thing. The main thing is you have to, you have to be transformed into the new, you know, new character of Christ. And Colossians chapter 3 verse 10, And have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Right? You have to put on, take off the old, put on the... You cannot put on your, your new clothes if you don't take off your old clothes, right? So you, you keep on taking off your old clothes and you're putting on a new and it's slowly, slowly, slowly you're changing. And then in James 1, uh, James chapter 1, verse 23, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says, says it's like someone who looked at his face in the mirror and just walk away. So every sermon that I preach here, I really wish you guys kind of grab something in it. Today's sermon, main point, main focus, is to turn away from sin because God judges sinner 
and he judges all the sin. We always hear that, oh, God loves the, God loves the sinner, but he just hates the sin. No. He hates it all. He hates the individual. I can, I can give you a lot of scripture that shows that God hates sin and he hates the individual that committed the sin. So we have to get away from that kind of bad decision. You know, you're going to fall, but by his grace, you're going to pick yourself up. You're going to have addiction. If you have any addiction, you really have to get it off. Because addiction is always bad. That means you have a prolonged things. Something is controlling you. Paul is saying that I can do anything, but I would not let anything to bind me and control me. And that's what addiction means. It's something that's controlling you. Okay. So, uh, I want to, I know the time is, is, this is a tremendously long sermon, sorry. Let me just give you one last uh, advice. If you're going to forget uh, the whole thing, at least remember this, okay? Because this is a very, very smart prayer by King David. Because King David is a man that he really understands humanity. He understands how much problem he has and how graceful God is. So in Psalm 19, verse 12 to 13, if you, if you are smart, you should memorize this. And you should pray this every single day. This is how smart he pray. But who can discern their own errors? Because he started to know that we have making so many mistakes, you don't even know how many mistakes you made. So forgive my hidden faults. Means things that I don't even know that I made mistake. Lord, please just forgive me. Isn't that so smart? Because I'm telling you, Judging by yourself, you may not know, but if judging from the eyes of God, every single day you have so, you made so many mistakes, you have committed so many sins, you know, even every little, little thought, a little bit of controlling, a little act of not love. The Bible, James, according to James, says, if you know something is good, something is right that you should do, and you did not do it, that is counted as your sin. So that means if I see somebody drowning in the water, and I know how to swim, but it's dangerous to go inside to try to save him, and I don't go down there and save him. That is a sin. Now, if you don't know how to swim, and you jump down there, that, that means you're a fool. You just kill yourself for nothing. But if you know how to swim, even though you're not too good in swimming, you know, you should jump down and help that person. Otherwise, it counts at your sin. Because you see something you can do, something you can help, but you're not helping out. That is sin. In God's eye, you're so easy to make a sin. That's why if, for anybody who learns how to swim, learn it well, okay? Because you're going to become as a swimmer. So if someone is drowning, you are supposed to go down there and try to save. Them. So the point is, there are so many sins that we, we, can't even, we can't even imagine. So David is saying, yes, Lord, I don't know. Nobody can count it. I can't even count it. But whatever I do, things that I don't even know, please forgive me. Please forgive all. In verse 13, make your servant also from willful sin. Keep your servant also from evil sin. May they not rule over me. Isn't that so smart? It's like, Lord, since you predict everything, since you control everything, if I'm going to make a big sin, stop me. I do that a lot of time. I say, Lord, if I'm going to make a big mistake in this one, stop me. Don't let me make it. Because if you stop you, you cannot do it, right? That's, that's a man understand the, the problem of humanity and leaning to a God that predestined all and asking God to help with his predestined power, with his controlling, do dominating power. Lord, if I'm going to make this mistake, stop it. Stop it. And then he said at the end, then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. He will be blameless. Not that he did not make any mistake. He's just innocent of great mistake. The big sin. Because there are big sin and there are small sin. And he knows there will be tons of small little sin. But at least I do not make the big sin. And if I don't have the great transgression, then I am blameless. You can see how David, King David understands sin. And understand how easy for us to fall into sin. And for us, Blazing Star, HGC, we are a supernatural team. We have so many gifts of God. So for this new year and the closing of year 2015, starting today, let's tighten up everything. It's like, if you're good with music, you can play rock and roll, you can play heavy metal, but you can also play classical. 
and this is classical. The Word of God is classical. I know sometimes we get, we get very, very supernatural and caught up. We can do supernatural things that people can never do. But this is a classical moment of time that the law of God is laid before us. All the sins, all the list of the sins that we talk about in Colossians chapter 5. Go home and recite it and think about it and make sure we don't fall into the trap of it. And we try to learn how to pray because prayer is a connection to God where we can gain the power to overcome sin because by your mere human nature, you cannot overcome sin. There's no way you can overcome all the sin. But only the Holy Spirit, power, the Holy Spirit anointing, you know, can help you overcome. And we all overcome, not just because we can overcome some kind of trials, but mainly we overcome sin. And we lean close to His grace. Let this church be a very clean church. I know we don't, I don't talk about sin that much, and this is pretty much a hard sermon, uh, sermon, but to lay it on you is like, if we, come, if we continue to live in those things, we are like a fool under the predestination path of God because we don't know how to make our right choice. And I'm not talking about a, a couple of times that you make the mistake or the 10 times that you make the wrong choice. I'm talking about a lifelong pursuit to turn yourself away from sin. Put down, lay down all your old man desire and old man passion because that's supposed to be crucified on the cross. Don't tell me that I have entitled this. We don't entitle anything. God may not take away that from you, but he takes away that from somebody else. And, so, and don't compare yourself with others because we are not in the same shoes. We are we're not in the same shoes. You don't know how everybody goes through. You don't know how much pressure that person is in. You know how hard he fights and how he fights. You know, some people are buying up and they are fighting till now. And you have your both hands. So it's not about others, it's about us. And sin is like a big word that is laying in front of us. And I got this sermon from the Lord, so I know this is something that we really need to deal with. And hopefully we all end the year of 2015 without any big, great transgression. Okay, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it's not an easy path. Nobody ever said it's going to be easy. A baptism, a conversion prayer is easy. But this lifelong journey of pursuing holiness and trying to live a godly life is not easy. But Lord, we thank you because you are so graceful, so merciful. You are not treating us and, and holding us accountable for our transgression. But Lord, there are so many addiction in so many wrongs we have become someone that we can't even change ourselves. We don't want to do it, but we, we cannot change ourselves. This is the way we are. But Lord, you said there is still chance of transformation still change chance of repentance and forgiveness before it's too late. Lord, we thank you. We're going to commit ourselves into this path and dedicate ourselves into this holy walk and bless this church, fulfill this church, have mercy upon this church. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.